Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. Engineering has made it possible for me to have an idea one day and have it in my hand the next day. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Ray Fikes, who for over 40 years has worked as a prosthetist at, at his company Fikes Brace and Limb. With more than 45 patents and patent pendings, he has been engineering solutions to solve the most challenging failed prosthesis cases. In addition to traditional techniques, Ray also has experience using cutting-edge technologies such as 3D printers, laser scanners, and CNC machines to develop prosthetic solutions. Ray, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, I'm glad to be here. So uh, tell us a little bit about your, your background. And, like, How did you get into prosthetics in the beginning? Uh, in 1980, I knew some someone that was in the field. Um, I came from a construction background and and knew that I didn't want to pour concrete the rest of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I was the actual financial backer for the company as a, as a partner. So, um, and at that time, there was no, there wasn't even a baccalaureate program, uh, educationally. Uh, just three short courses. And, and then we, we saw it evolve to two year, four year, uh, programs. And, and now it's at the master's level, PhD. Uh, being proposed, and uh, and I'm and I'm sorry to say that I've seen a drop in clinical prowess ever since. <laughs> oh, is that right? Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, what's being taught today is just not based in in with good mechanics. I mean, mm. um, well, I call them Jeopardy prosthetists, Jeopardy orthodists. They have all the answers. And, <laughs> but none of the practical experience. Yeah. And uh, one of your questions was uh, about the art and science. Um, and, boy, that's a, such a good question. I mean, it's a good question for prosthetics. It's a good question for 3D printing. Even even more profound with 3D printing. But um, the, these candidates that we get out of school, it's almost like you have to deprogram them and and let them know that the school that you went to is the salt and pepper. This is the meal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and uh, so there's a little bit of deprogramming that goes along with it. But but the, but the underlying uh, important factor is is do they have hand skills? Mm. You know, your bag of tricks can only be as deep as the things that you can actually make yourself. And I I found that to be equally um, important in. Just the the engineering, the R and D, the process development that that we do here in Pipeline, the engineers that know how to work with their hands. You know, these are uh, the the guys who maybe grew up working on their cars or, or fixing their bikes or just doing mechanical things, building with their hands. You know, they're the ones who progress the fastest. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, I, I think that's universal. Yeah, uh, we we find and especially in, in our field because it's it's so mechanical. Uh, and, and, uh, there's a healthy relationship with engineering for sure. Uh, and with the number of patents that I have and, 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 and I've only patented a, a portion of the things that, um, that I've innovated over, the, over the years, but, uh, there, that handoff from the prosthetic clinical world to the engineering world is, is a slippery one. I mean, you, you, uh, a product can get engineered and and uh it takes it to a level that you know allows people to to run with two prostheses in the olympics and that didn't come from our field that's the marriage that we have with engineering uh but there are there are a lot of a lot of areas that aren't understood and and uh, and but it's given me uh w- when i get in those situations uh a, a different demeanor and 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 um and an understanding of you know when you when you bring a a project to an engineer 
you're doing it for a reason because you can't progress any further without them. But, but you have to be, you have to know that, that, uh, there, there are certain boundaries clinically and, and physiologically that, mm. that have to be maintained. And, and, uh, sure. So, yeah. So you know, your relationship just gets better and better the more you appreciate engineering. Yeah. Well, I, you mentioned uh, just a minute ago the art versus science. I, I'm curious to dig into that a little bit. How much of prosthetics is art versus science, and, and maybe how has that changed over the years? Because I imagine with technology, maybe maybe it is more science now than it was in the past. Oh, I think uh, I think it definitely is. It's, I think it's definitely more science now because we've gone from wooden legs and rubber feet to energy storing graphite composite prosthesis that people run on and if you come to me and you say well i've just lost my leg and i want to run i have to say do you want to jog or do you want to sprint i mean is that specific you know because alignment wise and we we'll we'll get into alignment later that's that's the biggest crisis in prosthetics is alignment Um, but uh i have to you know the alignment for a sprinter is all forward center gravity is in front of your feet and so I, I inherit a lot of amputees with these, uh, you know, eight thousand dollar feet that they can't. I'm supposed to be able to run on this. <laughs> well, it's not aligned correctly. You know, you're never going to run on it and, and, and without changing the fit of your socket. He said, "Well, it fits terrible." I said, "You can't say that." And uh, because you know, I, I tell my amputees, I hold, I hold their arm like this and squeeze it, and I'll challenge you to do the same thing. It doesn't hurt when you squeeze it. That's a good tight fit. But when you turn it just a little bit like that, hmm. you'll feel you'll feel the pain in your arm. They get it. They get it just like that. And many times we take that socket that feels like it's it, it, it doesn't fit with proper alignment. It fits fine. Interesting. And and it kind of leads into what you you add. Uh, there's a lot of these things that you've asked that are, they're all married together, but. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to ramble and, 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 and get ahead, but um, we'll, we'll cover that. We'll cover that issue later because I know it's going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's start at the beginning. So let's say I'm an amputee. I, I come to your clinic. I walk in the door. What, what's the process that, that you and I go through, um, uh, you know, looking for a, a prosthetic solution? Well, the first thing that uh, they have to be evaluated and categorized by pathology uh, a young person that loses their limb in a motorcycle accident, that's a, it, they're almost a completely different procedure. It is a completely mm-hmm. different procedure and treatment plan uh, for than someone that's elderly that has diabetes, which is 8 out of 10 amputees. It's pandemic level. I mean, it's... Is uh, that right? 8 yeah. out of 10 are eight from out of 10 diabetes. 8 out of 10 amputees from diabetes, yes. Wow. Yeah, epidemic. Huh. Uh, but we have to... So we have to categorize them, you know, you know, uh, what category are we going to put them in, uh, you know, activity wise, uh, which speaks directly to what componentry that we're going to put them in. You know, for someone that's lost their limb above the knee that's young, uh, uh, they're going to want a hydraulic computerized uh, microprocessor knee. Oh, and then really? To... I, I didn't even know that was a thing. Microprocessor oh, yeah. in the prosthetic. Uh-huh. And what is that? I mean, what is it processing? What is what's Not the much. feedback? Not much. As an engineer, you'd, you'll appreciate this, you know. Uh, and I'll share, I'll, I'll share an example with you uh, quickly. In, in 2002, I tried to buy a four terabyte hard drive. It was the size of a uh, filing cabinet, and it was thirty-three thousand dollars. <laughs> and and now four terabytes you changed. Can, you can get on your phone you know, for a few hundred dollars. Yeah. But when Medicare assigns a, an L code to a procedure like that, technology doesn't come down; it's frozen in time. I mean, it's it's a it's a really sore spot with me. My. My coffee pot has as much computing power as these knees do. And Medicare's allowable for that is $16,000 just for that code. Wow. Just because it has a computer in it. Holy cow. So what does that do? That relegates th- those really nice quality products to people that have good insurance or rich. Mm-hmm. Or workman's, workman's comp. And it, and I, it's a crisis, but, uh, um, 
I, and I, I don't I don't know how to resolve that uh, other than uh, wait for the the patents to term. Yeah, and, right. And then and then come in t- and take a knee that uh, cost them twenty five hundred dollars to make. My cost on that knee is forty thousand dollars. My cost. I mean, wow. I'm I'm in I'm in a business to where it, to liken it to a, 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 a car lot. Uh, how crazy would this be? You go to buy a car and the guy says, uh, "Well, pick one you like and then drive off in it." Because Medicare says we have to deliver it before we can bill it. So I have to basically buy somebody a car just to treat them. Wow. wow that it, sounds frustrating. When somebody says, what do you do for a living? I tell them I got a really bad finance company. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one of the areas your, your finance company uh, specializes in is, is these failed prostheses. How do they commonly fail, uh, and and what are some things that that you folks have done to reduce those failures? Well, it's it and fail fail in in the pro, in the medical world just means that the procedure failed. Uh, prosthetic uh, catastrophic failure, mechanical failure, uh, is uh, is pretty low. I mean, and there again, kudos to the engineering world. The the component parts that we use have been engineered. Uh, uh, extremely well. Uh, a Russian titanium uh, that's not that's not milled; it's forged, and they can get they can get uh, uh, some of their components that ours are rated to 220 pounds for. They can get 500 pounds mm. rating out of them just for that uh, because because it, they're forged. That grain is not dis- disrupted and and. Uh, uh, so there's not a lot of mechanical failure. Uh, the, the failed pr- prosthetic uh, procedure is because of uh, different things. Uh, you know, unfortunately, more than half of the, the people th- that do my profession sh- shouldn't be doing it. Um, and another dynamic is that uh, uh, our, our field, in our field, one company comprises over 50% of the wow. whole market Oof. and their clinicians are, uh, they have quarterly incentives and, and it, with any, any artistic endeavor, I mean, uh, the Mona Lisa wasn't painted and, and, and that last brush stroke was it. Come back and touch it up here, touch it up there, redo this, redo that. It's no different in prosthetics and, or anything else, you know, um, that, ha- that, has an art and a science to it, hmm. you know. So uh, we have a situation where patients or uh, clinicians in th- those situations are, are faced with, I need to remake that socket. It doesn't fit like I want it to, but I'll lose my job if I do. Oh, interesting. So that's conflicting a fa- that's priorities. A, that's a failed That's a failed prosthesis. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Huh. And... Alignment is probably 70% of the reason. Okay. Um, all right. So you're talking about alignment being, you know, 70%, a large chunk of that problem. Are, what other, if you were to coin them engineering challenges, does your team, team face when developing these prosthetics? Uh, well, the, the, the biggest problem, the most profound problem in pros, prosthetics is, is that, uh, uh, sockets don't change physically, but amputees do. Mm. I have one amputee that, that has over 20% volume increase and decrease within a 24 hour period. Wow. Within one day? Yeah, within one day. And I had to wow. make, make him a very, excuse me, a very special prosthesis, but I had to, but I had to make him a number of them. Uh, you know, and, and you don't, with my company, it's about solving the problem, not, not, filling a prescription and I'm challenged by this problem that I've been faced with. And I, and at my age, I love those, <laughs> you know, I, you know, and I don't care. And I'll lose, I lose money sometimes trying different products and, and I, I lose money sometimes, but there's, there's where most of my patentable ideas come from is you dig into a, a problem that other companies are not able to solve and, and when you solve it, it's really gratifying, but it's, it's can be profitable and patentable also. Yeah, 
Yeah, very cool. All right. Well, I'm going to take a very short break here, share with the listeners that uh, teampipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform verification testing on your devices. We're speaking with Ray Fikes today, owner at Fikes Brace and Limb. So, Ray, you have kind of pioneered, um, I, I don't know if pioneered is, is the right word, but you have certainly um, uh, developed new ways of using 3D printers for your field of prosthetics. Um, uh, how has 3D printing and 3D scanning changed the field of, of prosthetics engineering? Boy, that's uh, we're going to have to do an- another segment to to get all that in it's <laughs> a long um, answer huh <laughs> and and I, I i like the word pioneering but uh uh we there's there's i've, I've done a, a video uh for youtube called removing the noise because someone comes to the 3d printing world and well let's get one of those 3d printers and just start printing things <laughs> and, and it's I, I i i can't tell you all the problems uh, involved and, and you probably already know they they have no CAD experience they have no design experience um, I have to take where we've been particularly successful is in in teaching is I'm teaching other prosthetists 3D printing but they're learning from a clinician not from a 3D printing company and we've developed our own technique uh, we've we've developed pioneered some some techniques in slicing that's particular to the vase mode printing world. We print sockets. We print vases, basically. Mm. You know, we're not con- we're not concerned with with uh, uh, with a uh, 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 bed finish and infill because uh, generally we don't use them. You know, uh, well, we 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 use them all the time. But but for a socket, uh, it's it's basic basically vase mode, and yeah. by by using vase mode and and I machine my own nozzles, uh, we print PETG sockets that that you can read a newspaper through. They're extremely oh, wow. cl- extremely clear. Interesting. I, so really thin then. Uh, they're th- they're th- I actually I can print with a two millimeter nozzle. I can print seven millimeters wide. Really? Yeah. We've we've learned how to do that and and. And I can still see the blanching of the skin. So you've really hacked these 3D printers then. You're not just taking an off-the-shelf 3D printer and letting it rip. You've done a variety of, of developments and yeah. improvements on these things to meet your Firm- needs, right? Yeah, firmware changes, um, thanks to Will, the guy you sent to me. <laughs> uh, uh, and nozzle and understanding what produces a clear, with, with a clear PETG, what actually makes it clear. Mm. And and design our nozzles nozzles around that, um, but the but the real trick to, uh, and the the pioneer, pioneering efforts that we, we that we should be noted for is is uh, is desi- is teaching how to design in vase mode, because when you're printing something in vase mode, you're printing uh, a, a, an OBJ or STL file that's solid. Rather than defining an inside and outside surface and and saying, I want this socket to be this wide, it's not going to be clear because you have an infill. So we we export a solid and we say, give me a 2.4 millimeter circumference around that. And uh, there's no, that's very easy, you know, in, three, in 3D printing world. Designing that, you know, making a, a custom silicone mold that's that you've just put a 2.4 millimeter uh exterior on that's got to fit in the next one with a a six millimeter gap uh designing in vase for vase mode is 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 a real uh uh, mind bender (laughs) i'm not familiar with the term vase mode is that a setting on your 3d printers okay It, it only prints an exterior Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you can make it different thicknesses. Yeah. You can make it different thicknesses. We've introduced two phenomena called banding and, and stacking. And we use simplify. Uh, there's, 
there's great slicers out there and but there again it's art and science you have it, what are you doing are you are you printing little octopus or little boats uh you're going to want a, a very small 0.4 millimeter nozzle and and uh and you're not going to be concerned with it it, it it's an artistic piece it's it's not uh, a man it's doesn't end it's crafting the dividing line is manufacturing and crafting yeah and yeah and so uh we use simplify slicer because of its multi-process uh settings and then we can take we can bring in multi-stacked sto files and use multi-processes on them and we stack those multiple molds it looks like one mold but it gives it a lay it's like almost like holding a mirror up to a mirror <laughs> there's mm, that okay. many variations wow. so we so within one layer we can print vase mode with an infill different layer heights different temperature different speed all within one layer ah incredible yeah well, uh, besides 3D printing and scanning, what else has changed about prosthetics technology over the past 30 years? Um, a lot. Everything, really. But um, the, uh, gosh, we, we, in my career, it was wooden legs and rubber feet. Uh, so the feet are all energy storing, dynamic carbon graphite. Um, uh, and uh, as we were talking about earlier, there's microprocessor, hydraulic, micro, there's hydraulic feet, microprocessor ankles, uh, the, uh, just the advent of composites, you know, mm. uh, yeah. uh, fiberglass, you know, sockets aren't, you know, or aren't carved out of wood anymore like yeah. they were in the seventies and, and early eighties. Oh, that must yeah. have been so uncomfortable. I mean, carved Actually, out of wood. Actually, you, you don't you don't find anybody now that has a point of reference to tell you. <laughs> but yeah. over my in my career, I, I've had them say, "Man, there was nothing like having a wooden socket after you really? sweated it, sweated in it that was really comfortable." Oh, interesting. Uh, but there again, their point of reference where they don't they don't they don't have the advent of knowing the sockets that we make today. You know. Yeah. But, yeah. But with you know, it's that's changed and and. Um, and in the wooden socket days, they wore socks, just wool socks. We call them stump socks. Okay. And as they would change in volume, the sock is not going to change. So they would mm. have to add socks, take them off. And that was their interface. And they're hygienically, uh, they can become, if you didn't wash them, they become very abrasive. And, and, mm. uh, and, uh, but now we use, uh, in, in the late eighties, the silicone liner, uh, became popularized and um and at that time up to that point for just a few years we were making our own silicone liners which uh and i do a lot of silicone now it's barbaric the way we were doing it back then but uh <laughs> but, but now uh uh probably the predominantly the, the uh uh ppe thermoplastic and elastomer is okay uh, is used and the silicones that we the uh Sure that we use and, and with the silicone and the TPE, I there's a lot of I can't tell. I have to take a soldering iron tool. Uh, TPE melts and silicone doesn't. So mm. <laughs> interesting. Uh, yeah. Going back to to 3D printing, I, I imagine these materials they have to hold up to quite a bit of of load, right? If if they're being used as a prosthetic, I mean, someone's walking on it. Um, Historically, and this is of course changing, of course, with better 3D printing materials. But historically, 3D printed materials have not been the strongest. How how do you get your materials, your 3D printed materials, to hold up to the abuse and the load that one would encounter uh, when using it in a, a prosthetic? That's an evolving uh, problem, and that we spend all of our time on. Uh, the stacking and banding that I was telling you about, we've come up with some very sophisticated slicing techniques that add thickness. Um, I only use and only teach 3D printing for diagnostic sockets because we want a clear initial fitting. 
we have to, we're dealing with soft tissue, uh, and, and, uh, bony tissue. And we want to be able to see the blanching of the skin. We want to be able to see the stretch of the, the cloth over the silicone, uh, over those bony areas. Uh, but what does the, the blanching of the skin refer to? Well, take your fingernail and press on it. it turns white. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're pressing the blood out. Got so it. O- over the bony areas, when I fit someone with a brace or uh, a prosthesis, I want to see that blanching. So I'm fitting them mm. from a vascular perspective. Okay. Uh, we've got some force, you know, uh, FSRs, you know, I've, I've used them for uh, measuring uh, some results, you know, f- force over these bony areas. And I've always been successful in relieving them using a clear diagnostic and, and a blanching technique. But I, I can tell you now definitively uh, that it's, it's around 5 PSI over a bony uh, a bony area, like the bo- uh, bones in your feet that are, that are protruding. Um, that's a, a, a 4 to 5 PSI. It, you're going to get an ulcerization. It's going to break down. So you want to you want to avoid blanching? Is that what you're saying? You're you're yes, analyzing it to make sure that blanching does not occur. So under five psi or so, that's that's your safe zone. Yeah, you won't see blanching with that. You know, and it's taken me decades to be able to tell you that. Yeah, I knew that my technique worked, but now with when I started using FSRs, FSRs uh, are uh, force sense force res- uh, force resistance. Um, it's a sensor, source sensor. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with force, it 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 um, it can you get more of a uh, it's like a, a strain gauge. Mm, uh, okay. It gives, give, you have more conductivity, and I think that's how it works. Uh, but uh, yeah, I forget where we were with all of that, but. Um, yeah. So as the force is distributed more evenly around the stump, the, um, uh, the, the, the amount of force being placed on any specific area of that stump goes down and, and, um, and that's what allows you to, to not get the blanching, right? Right. Right. And, okay. and understand that, that when someone's standing on in a socket that I've made for them hydraulically, uh, we have to support their weight comfortably and still allow blood to flow. Yeah. Okay. A, a very bad fitting socket. There's pain involved, and there's going to be ulcerations, and there's going to be sores. Um, so that's the challenge. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, on, go and ahead. on top of that, on top of that, you, you double, triple the criticality uh, by how much that particular patient uh, changes in volume. Interesting. Um, you have a really interesting product that I don't think is available anywhere else. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they're called swim limbs that give amputees the ability to swim again. Um, how did this development come about and, and what were some of the engineering challenges that you and your team had to overcome to, to make this a reality? Well, uh, as a prosthetist, when I became certified in scuba diving, I got some, some fins and uh boy they they were longer and i thought these are these are these are great i couldn't hardly drive them you know uh propel myself with them because they were stiffer and longer mm-hmm. and so th- after i understood th- the issue there uh someone came up with a with an ankle that you could pull a pin and it would it would uh articulate 90 degrees and then you put a swim fin on top of that so you got the length of the limb the length of the swim fin but their residual limb that they're driving it with is only six inches long and when i watch them and you see them all the time still to this day um because you're right the only place that they can get the them is from me but uh it's comical to me because they're swimming and it and they're not they're not propelling themselves with it at all Hmm. you know it's a three foot long combination that they're driving with a six inch residual limb mm, yeah you see what i mean so yep. we uh it's it's actually very simple to to do uh we have one fin that in mesh mixer we can scale it to whatever size and and we marry it once we get a fit on on their prosthesis we use that that file marry them up and then we we print them uh with a pretty complicated slicing uh, 
routine, but, uh, uh and, and we had to develop a, 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 a printer that would, would print a thousand millimeters tall. And, um, and that's how they came about. So how have, without giving away any of your trade secrets, of course, how have you developed these, uh, customized 3D printers? I mean, you, you buy something off the shelf and what, you just take it apart and, and put it back together with new parts to make it do what you want it to do? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, with CNC, you know, uh, the controller is, is the worth of the printer. Mm, <laughs> the rest is okay. just aluminum st- structure. Uh, yeah. With a, with a thousand millimeter tall uh, bill like that, we had to put timing gears on the X. Uh, it has dual uh, lead screws for the Z axis, and we had to put a timing belt on top uh, uh, just just to fine tune it. So we went through a learning curve with that. Yeah, very cool. Our, well, our newest our newest product uh, is a uh, and and it speaks to it's the uh, the strength of of this clear socket that we've made we to, to make it clear it's plexiglass it's fragile uh, there's not a clear plastic that's that's durable uh, but processors like myself that want to see blanching we uh, uh, insist on a clear fit but we can't let them leave with that you know just fall it, it can fall over from just a, a setting position without a limb in it and it'll break you know uh, so we've developed what we call a rapid wrap, and they are laminations that are pre-rolled with attachment, uh, the attachment bolts in it. So you, you, it comes out of a package, and you put it over the, over the the, uh, the print, and it's a UV cure resin that we've developed. Hmm. And in 15 minutes, you got a the beautiful, <laughs> but the, they have the strength that we need. I've I've had 300 pounders on them for six months. Wow. Okay. So it, it starts out as a 3D printed part, but then you wrap it with, um, what did you call it? Some kind of resin based? Yeah. It's, we call them the rapid wrap, but they're UV cure resin pre, uh, prepackaged wraps with the Got attachment it. so we can bolt, bolt the, the foot onto it. Uh, okay. And, okay. And then that's, that's a, a diagnostic, uh, you know, they'll wear it until they've, like a new amputee will shrink a lot and we can make a bunch of adjustments and then we'll do their definitive. Mm. So the protocol for prosthetics is as a new amputee, you're going to get a temporary one or a preparatory. Okay. Because some people shrink an un- un- unbelievable amount. They'll lose half of their, vo- half of their volume. Half. Oh, yeah. that's incredible. Well, they have post-operative swelling from their limb being cut off. I see. And so, okay. and we want to get them up and walking. Yeah. And some companies won't start until they go through that shrinkage process. But 3D printing is so much cheaper and faster for me. It doesn't matter to me. I'll get you yeah. up, get you walking, and the socket's not going to last you very long. And so after six months or so, whatever shrink is going to happen has largely happened. And then at that point, they get their, their permanent yeah. prosthetic. Okay. Yeah. And the permanent prosthetic, is that... Also 3D printed, or is that made of a, a different material altogether? Fiberglass, carbon fiber. Some people are are doing that They're with uh, nylon and 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 uh, carbon infused filaments. Uh, there are definitive sockets. Uh, they're very drab. Uh, we we do we use epoxy and uh, it's a polyester epoxy uh, resin. That doesn't yellow, and we we do very high graphics. You've seen limbs, I'm sure, with just unbelievable graphics on them. And 3D printing is just not there. I mean, I'm cheating my patient. I'm like I'm drunk on the technology. You go, you're gonna you're gonna get a 3D printed definitive when I can I can make something that's so so much stronger, lighter, and better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just not there yet. So. Uh, believe me, a person can justify the money that they're going to spend for 3D to get into the 3D printing world prosthetically just with diagnostics and mm. foot orthotics and swim fins. And there's, there's things that you can do, uh, that you can't do any other way. Like, like the yeah. swim fin. You can't, you can't manufacture that any other way. Yeah. And once they do get their, their final prosthetic, what, what material is that made out of the socket at least? The socket will be made out of a braided carbon. 
Okay. Yeah, and it comes in, it's tubular. And uh, it's uh, the bias is on a 45-degree weave. Um, and, you know, with carbon graphite as an engineer, fiber orientation is everything. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so when I make, I, I'd also make feet, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the carbon that I would lay up for a socket is at 45 degrees to itself. And it's extremely light, very thin and, and strong, incredibly strong. But the feet, uh, I make a running foot like Pistorius runs in the Olympics, and no one else does that. I mean, it, I don't know of any other company that makes the feet. They buy them from the big manufacturers. But mm. I, we built our own autoclave, and, and, uh, and they have to be autoclave. They, they are, you, you can use a pressure mold, but um, you want one fiber uh, t- to one molecule of resin with zero air even at the molecular level, to get that kind of strength yeah. out of it. Uh, so we understand we understand 3D printing, we understand fiber orientations in, uh, uh, in, in making a, a component part like that. And it's, it's funny, it's something that I may come to your firm for because there's a real need for, for uh, using 3D printer. Uh, to dispense uh, fibers hmm. for a limb like that, and we use it just for the layup. You know, the the epoxy would would be heated only enough to to make it uh, fluid enough to place those fibers so precisely, exactly where you wanted them. Because I don't know if you've ever made anything out of carbon graphite uh, with prepreg. It's a pain in the butt. It's peeling yeah, we don't, stick, we don't layer do after layer, layer after layer. It's peeling <laughs> stick, and it's like taffy. Yeah. And it, the laying something up is just a pain in the butt, but we should be using a printer for that. Yeah. Well, um, let me get uh, one more question, and then we'll we'll um, wrap it up here. But uh, within the context of, of the, the space of engineering, what, what's one thing that frustrates you and one thing that brings you joy? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's another deep one. Like, <laughs> another second episode, yeah, third episode. Yeah, I, I think that what brings me joy is is I think I've already already said it. You know, from forty three years of doing this, from wooden legs and rubber feet to uh, the, the you know the, the materials and processes that have been uh, uh, afforded to me now uh, that. Engineering has, has allowed a guy with a lot of concepts, especially with 3D printing, just uh, to go. I mean, I can I can think of something that I think engineering has made it possible for me to have an idea one day and have it in my hand the next day. Mm, well said. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's nothing like that because I, uh, I had a a product that was actually uh, medical to device of the year and and. Um, Brussels and in, in, uh, France, and prototyping it, we had to make a uh, a plaster Paris tube, and then buy O rings and and glue them to this every uh, five millimeters to make a ribbed structure. And with CAD today, that takes me. I mean, it, it took it took over a week to make the mold to make this first prototype. Yeah, and and. And now I can, I can I can make that same mold in about five minutes on uh, on Fusion 360 and print it overnight and have it the next day. Amazing! En- engineering has afforded <laughs> that to me. Yeah, you know there is one more thing I wanted to ask. Uh, I forgot about this one. You use 3D scanning as part of your process. We do 3D scanning and reverse engineering here at Pipeline as well, and, and we have a scanner that we use and some software that we use. But you are not using uh, a, an industrial scanner. You found a much more cost-effective solution that is accurate enough for sh- your needs. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, as an independent, I am I'm cheap. <laughs> uh, you know, everything that we uh, – every process that we're using uh, – I can, you can pay a range of four thousand dollars to sixty thousand dollars, and and uh, 
And it was no different with the scanner. I have a white light laser uh, scanner that I paid $19,000 for. And now I'm using an iPhone with a comb scanner. It's C-O-M-B, like you comb your hair with, comb scanner. It's $700 prescription, a uh, subscription every year. And so you don't, you're not buying anything. You know, I, yeah. I, I went and bought, I'm, I'm an Android guy, but I, I've got an iPhone mini in my pocket. I, I, so I carry two phones, but one of them's my scanner. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse that's, me. That's amazing. And uh, the accuracy but, is within, I think you said within like a millimeter or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found that to be a big problem with, uh, uh, especially working with patients, uh, when surface scans are done of limbs, we just take for granted that that, that it's accurate. You bring it into uh, your, your proprietary software or mesh mixer. I use mesh mixer for everything. It's an unbelievable, uh, powerful program, but, uh, uh, We've developed in our school, we've developed a routine. Say you, you import it with this data. Uh, OBJ gives you, um, a, like a, a photograph on top of your scan. And, uh, we have, we take measurements. And w- once we import that, uh, from the comb scan into our, you know, I, I, I make sure that everyone, you got to validate your scan metrics. You know, the lighting in the room or, you know, there's all, especially with LIDAR. You know, uh, scanning someone right by a, a really bright window, you know, mm. it's, it's, it's light and distance. It's going to affect it to a certain degree, but, but, the, but suffice it to say, whatever you're using, bring it into your project and, and, and validate it. And we found that, that comb scans are, I mean, they're subject to, uh, you're measuring soft tissue with some calipers, um, and you can, there's compression to be considered. So we try not to compress, but we're within one, two millimeters. And uh, so we fly. I wouldn't use it if it wasn't accurate. Yeah, with an iPhone. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> oh, it's, so, it's so fun. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> I can hear the joy in your voice, Ray. That's great. So, Ray, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Well, I live by email, so uh, I empty my inbox every day. So, Fikes at gmail.com. My okay. name is at gmail. Simple as that's that. That's R-A-Y-F-I-K-E-S, right? That's, that's correct. Well, um, I think we, we can wrap it up there, but I wanted to thank you for being on the show and, and sharing a little bit about what you do and how engineering has helped your world of prosthetics. Uh, thank you so much, Ray. I sure appreciate it. Well, I think the thanks is all mine because you know, I'm living the dream. I'm a high-tech dinosaur with <laughs> t- trained in old school, but now I get to play with uh, these digital uh digital techniques and, and great uh, uh, materials and process that you guys have developed. So thanks, Engineering World. <laughs> well, on behalf of the Engineering World, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.